The god of war from Norse mythology is this guy, Tyr. And Tyr has one of the most relatable tragic stories in mythology. A story of tragedy, mutilation, losing his purpose. But hey, at least the man got Tuesday named after him, right? Tuesday? Tuesday? Huh? You cannot possibly tell the story of Tyr without also telling the story of Fenrir, a giant wolf, son of Loki but raised by Tyr, until Fenrir was betrayed by one of his father figures and helped to end the cosmos in his quest for vengeance. <laughs> Damn, this one has all the makings of an epic video, so let's do this. Note that there are some extra details about Tyr that don't really fit the flow of my storytelling, but for completion's sake, I want to include them at the end of the video, so watch until then to get everything there is to know about Tyr. Tyr was born to the Jotun Hymir, and if you're not familiar, the Jotun are often depicted as giants and mostly known as the enemies of the gods. But like every major god is part Jotun, Thor, Odin, Tyr, Heimdall. It's like the Aesir gods saw the Jotun as something lesser and thought themselves better than them, while they're actually sharing the same blood. I feel like there's some seriously deep social commentary in that statement somewhere. So Tyr's father was the Jotun Hymir, and Tyr's mother is never mentioned. But we do know that his grandmother was a monster with 900 heads, so if Tyr's mother inherited even a fraction of those, <laughs> I see why Hymir was attracted to her. Oh, he mere you freaky Jotun, you. I'm gonna give you a minute in case your innocence needs a moment to figure this one out. Tyr and his father Himir didn't have the best relationship, and it actually ends with Himir dying because his son Tyr and his buddy Thor uh, wanted to get drunk. It's literally the world's most epic beer run, but we'll get to that later because chronologically, Tyr and Thor first went on an adventure with very dark consequences. One day, Odin had visions of the end of the world, visions that he called Ragnarok. And he gathered all the gods around to tell them about these visions. Like, so listen, I, I had a dream, like a vision, a dream, you know, I, when I dream I have visions. And there's a snake that's gonna kill you, Thor, just roll with me on this one, it's gonna kill you. And also there's a giant wolf, right, then that's gonna kill me somehow. And then there's some crazy lady that's somehow half a zombie and is... It's super scary and we really need to do something. Don't forget that the Norse gods are basically always drunk, so this didn't sound all that crazy to them. And because Loki, who always has something smart to say, kept awfully quiet during all of this, Odin was like, wait a minute, didn't you give birth to an eight-legged horse once? Damn it, you gave birth to a giant snake and a giant wolf, didn't you? Loki. So Loki told the truth on the condition that everybody promises not to tell his wife, Sigyn, and that truth was that Loki had gotten freaky with a giantess, the Jotun Angerboda. And because Loki went in raw and got the Loki juice, she then gave birth to a serpent, Jormungandr, a wolf, Fenrir, and a girl that was half beautiful and half a corpse, Hell. No one was really surprised by this because it is Loki. But Odin was certain that he could prevent Ragnarok if they go and get the kids and imprison them, because which problem is not solved by kidnapping and child imprisonment, right? So Odin sent Tyr and Thor to get the job done. And when Tyr and Thor realized that their names both start with a T, they were like, bro, TNT, what? TNT! So TNT went to Jotunheim, smashed some heads in and kidnapped the wolf, who was still a puppy at the time, kidnapped the serpent, who was still far from its final form, and kidnapped the half-corpse girl, and delivered all of them to Odin in Asgard. Odin then threw the serpent into the oceans to die. He banished the dead corpse girl into the land of the dead, and the wolf puppy... They kept the puppy, because even Odin wasn't that heartless. Tyr was the one who took care of Fenrir, the wolf. And I know what you're thinking, isn't Tyr like the god of war? How does he have time to raise a puppy? And you're right, the Vikings were all about warfare, so if anyone would absolutely adore the god of war, it would be them. Problem was, part of the reason the Vikings loved war so much is because when you die in battle, you get to enter Valhalla, and the one who picked the warriors for Valhalla was Odin's Valkyries. So really, in battle and in death, the Vikings worshipped Odin, and Tyr was kind of 
out of a job. So Jobless Tyr was perfect for the task of raising Loki's son Fenrir. And over time, him and Fenrir developed a father-son-like relationship. Mind you that Fenrir was smart, as smart as any god, and he could talk and all that, so this went way deeper than your standard dog and owner relationship. It's okay. Tyr and Fenrir built a serious bond, while outside of Tyr, everyone was afraid of Fenrir. Because this wolf did not stop growing. Fenrir grew bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, at some point, the Old Norse text said that his fangs touched both sky and ground when wide open. But it's like, holy embellishment, Batman. All right, calm down, bro. What were these Norse mythology writers smoking? Point is, Fenrir was huge. So again, except for Tyr, the Aesir gods were scared of Fenrir. They had not forgotten Odin's drunk story from a while ago, the whole Ragnarok thing about being eaten by a wolf and seeing Fenrir's size, Odin wasn't exactly sure that keeping Fenrir around on Asgard was the best idea anymore. So he decided that it was time to chain Fenrir up. Problem was, we're talking about a giant wolf, like you can't just put a leash on him, tie him up and call it a day. So the gods had to trick Fenrir. They told him that they were amazed by his size and strength and that they would like to measure it. <laughs> Uh, even when I wrote that sentence, I was thinking like, that, <laughs> that sentence, man, play that back, play the last part of that sentence back out of context and tell me you don't have to laugh, man. I'm not being childish, that's just funny. They made Fenrir believe that they wanted to test his strength by putting chains on him to see if he can just bust out of them see how strong he is. It's a classic in R. Kelly's playbook, really. He called it Saturday Night. So the gods did that and Fenrir burst out of the chains. He was too strong. The gods were amazed and Fenrir was proud. So they did it again. And of course, Fenrir was willing to put on another show and he burst out of the chains again. Too strong can't hold me. Everybody played the part, wowed and amazement, all leading up to the final act of the charade. The gods had special chains crafted by the dwarves, and these chains were as thin as silk, but magical and quite un breakable, made out of six key ingredients that are now forever missing in the world. The sound of a cat's footfall, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain, and the sinew of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spit of the birds. The gods called these chains Gleipnir, and Fenrir was no fool. Everybody knows that once an item has a name, it's special, special. So Fenrir wasn't really feeling like Gleipnir should be put on him, like it wasn't the best idea. So before he allowed the gods to chain him up again, he asked them for insurance to make sure they don't trick him. The condition was that a god had to put his arm between Fenrir's fangs while he attempts to break free. Just in case. All the gods refused, they were too scared. But Tyr knew what was at stake and was willing to sacrifice his arm. Now you might call this ultimate bravery and commitment to Odin's cause and the prevention of Ragnarok, or you might call it the ultimate betrayal against Fenrir. But Tyr did what he did. He put his arm between Fenrir's fangs and let him be chained with Gleipnir. And of course, Fenrir could not break out of the magical chains. And he bit Tyr's arm off and roared in anger over this betrayal. And as his fangs were wide open, the gods quickly stuck a sword in between them, forever piercing him and forcing his fangs open in an agonizing pain only made worse by Tyr's betrayal. That was Fenrir's fate, and it sent Fenrir down a path of hatred, never trusting anyone again. Hatred that would one day drive Fenrir to end the world and confront Tyr, the man who broke his heart. Now who wants to talk about the world's most epic beer run? The gods ran out of alcohol and they sent Thor to force Aegir, the personification of the sea, to brew more alcohol for them, which major disrespect like dude's kind of the sea personified like he got things to do like being the sea and all that you know floods all that stuff but thor went to aegir and insisted and aegir refused but thor really insisted and thor is thor so aegir tried to outwit him by saying he doesn't have a cauldron big enough to brew all that alcohol and that he'd need a cauldron that was at least miles deep, which literally, that's ridiculous because no one has a cauldron that's miles deep. Except 
Two was like, yo, my dad's like a raging alcoholic and he has a cauldron that's 10 miles deep. Problem is, we're not really talking, so let's steal it. TNT back in action, baby. TNT rolled up to Himir's home, and Himir didn't exactly welcome his son Tyr back, but it was his son. So it was like, whatever, you and your friend there, who's clearly overcompensating with that massive hammer, can stay for dinner. They stayed for dinner, and the next morning, Himir went fishing, and Thor asked if he could come with him. So Himir let Thor join him on his boat, and you put a Norse god and a Jutun in a small boat in the middle of the ocean, only one thing happens, broke back Asgard. They had a contest to see who's stronger and braver. So when Himir thought they'd rowed far enough into the ocean to fish, Thor said they should row even further because I'm braver. And when they finally stopped and started fishing, they first caught two whales, because why not? And then out there, so deep into the ocean, something bit their bait. Something big. Something massive. It's bigger than that, Chris. It's large. And with insane strength, Thor reeled it in and pulled a monster out of the depths of the ocean. Actually, monster doesn't even begin to describe it. What emerged out of the oceans was bigger than any monster, bigger than anything anyone could possibly imagine. And Himir was terrified at its sight and hid in the back of the boat. But Thor was like... Yes! He's a friend from work! It was Loki's son. The snake Thor once delivered to Odin to be banished in the ocean. It was the world serpent Jormungandr, which had been roaming the oceans for years and grew so large it could now circle the world entirely. Jormungandr, though, wasn't exactly happy to see Thor again, and the god of thunder immediately got ready to fight. But he only managed to swing at Jormungandr once before Himir cut the rope to the bait and rowed the boat away into safety. Thor was so pissed at Himir's cowardice that he slapped him around on the boat. And after they got back to the shore, Himir was like, Yo, uh, that was crazy, wasn't it? So, you want to carry the whales back to my horse or the boat or... Uh... And Thor was like, so you want to carry the whales to my horse or the boat? Or shut up, coward. And carried the boat, the whales and Himir himself back into the horse all by himself. And that's how you make a grown man your son. So now, since Thor was basically Himir's father, him and Tyr simply demanded the cauldron. Remember, they were there for a cauldron, you might have forgotten. But Himir had a go at one more attempt to retain his pride. He said he would only give them the cauldron they needed for their alcohol if Thor could pass a test of strength. Smash a special goblet. So Thor took that goblet and straight up bazooka it into a stone pillar and the entire pillar crumbled. But the goblet was still intact. So then Himir's wife, Thor's mom, told Thor to throw the goblet against Himir's thick head. And Thor did that and the goblet broke. You don't question the details of the goblet story so much, it's super weird. The point is that Thor made Himir his son and basically took his girl too. And by street laws, that now also made Thor's Tyr's daddy. Defeated, Himir let Thor take the cauldron, which was so large and heavy that Tyr, with all his strength, could only move it for like inches. But Thor swung that thing on his shoulder like it's nothing and walked out of there. And legend has it that at this point, Thor's balls were so big, he barely fit through the gates of the castle. Now you'd think this story is over, but Ymir wasn't done embarrassing himself. So he and an army of giants ambushed Thor and Tyr on their way home, but TNT simply killed them all. I told you this was the world's most epic beer run. Time for the extra notes. There is reason to believe that Tyr was once considered the supreme god in ancient, ancient times, before Norse mythology as we know it was even a thing. This comes down to the fact that over various ancient languages, the root of his name, Tyr, can be traced back to the word Deus, which basically translates to daylight, daylight sky god, or just sky, heaven, divine being, basically the god. And it's also where the name Zeus comes from, and a lot of other supreme rulers derive their name from the word Deus, including Tyr somehow. Now granted this is just a theory because there's not really texts on this, but if it's true, why Tyr was eventually demoted to just be the god of war is unclear. Some assume that his original personality was split up into Odin, Thor and Tyr, but eventually Tyr ended up as the god of war. And you can argue that the loss in status might be symbolized in the loss of an arm in the stories. 
If that whole sinews of a bear thing was weird to you in the ingredients, yeah, that was weird to me too, because that's not something that doesn't exist in the world. Bears have sinews, even though they're really short. Uh, this might all come down to a very bad translation, and instead of sinews, it might have been the nerves of a bear, implying that nerves are brave and fearless. Also, in another version of Norse mythology, Odin is said to be Tyr's father, but that version literally contradicts itself in itself and it doesn't make any sense. So it's generally accepted that Hymir was Tyr's dad and there was actually no point in me telling you this other than to show you how confusing and contradicting Norse mythology can sometimes be. So forget that, Hymir is Tyr's dad. Also, it's important to note that in his role as the god of war, Tyr was also the god of law and justice. So he also oversaw assemblies to settle disputes and elect leaders before it became actual bloodshed warfare. In that regard, he was kind of a strategic god of war, more in the sense of Athena or the Romans Mars, rather than just the bloodthirsty god of war like Ares was often depicted as. And guys, this is always so cringe, so at least I got the dog to make this visually more appealing. It's true that a subscription helps a lot. So if you enjoyed this video, if you could subscribe, it would mean the world. If you would turn on the notifications so that bell rings when I upload, which I do twice a week, it would mean the world. If you want to leave a comment, that would be amazing. Leave a comment, let me know what you thought, let me know what you want to see next, or critique me on something I might have gotten wrong. And I'll see you guys on the next one, alright? Alright.